when it comes to content creation it all boils down to storytelling and people are not just consuming content passively but are also actively trying to understand what they want and don't want to watch content is still the king but context is the kingdom content creation is a living breathing process as you write design or produce to discuss this and much more we're going to be having our industry experts joining us shortly meanwhile we'd request all our delegates to kindly be seated as we're getting the stage ready for our upcoming discussion the first panel discussion on content creation no more formulas so this is a theme of the entire event and we're excited that we have with us our illustrious panel joining us before we get them on stage just would like to mention we have the managing director free mantle the founder and ceo contelo pictures the head content alliances geo studios we've got the ceo of phantom studios we've got the business head of sony sub pal and sony max movie cluster the co-founder and managing partner locomotive global inc and we have the moderator who's going to be the managing director of bodhi tree multimedia i believe in interest of time it is time for me to call all our panelists on stage first up the managing director free mantle aradhna bhola the founder and ceo contelo pictures abhimanyu singh head content alliances geo studios shobhasan ceo phantom studios shrishti behalaria business head sony sappal and sony max movie clusters neeraj vyas and the co-founder and managing partner locomotive global inc sundar adan to kindly join us along with our session chair managing director bodhi tree multimedia mothik tholia let's give them all a big big round of applause while says we welcome um, hi everyone um, it's an honor to uh, moderate this session where we have um, all the industry veterans the stalwarts of the industry and what is really great about this panel is it's a combination of uh, all the industries in the media creation space represented from television to films to ott uh, the panel here brings a lot of experience between them and also a lot of talent and uh, we would really like to get all their insights from them today <coughs> in as gorov rightly said uh, we are at a, the india story is i think the more, one of the most exciting when it comes to content creation you are the only industry where we have uh the ott business growing uh, apparently is supposed to double in the next couple of years and at the same time the television industry growing as well at a very decent rate uh that represents an interesting uh, content challenge so as to say uh, in terms of um, audiences in terms of tastes in terms of uh, where the industry is going over the last few years the last time we had something like this was in the early 2000s when you saw the shift to satellite tv from uh, terrestrial and uh, it took a little time to find the sweet spot for the industry and uh, right now it's pretty much the same uh, and that's what right now most of the industry is looking for in terms of what is that sweet spot which is going to define content for the next decade or so and i think that's what we will uh explore today with uh, you know no set formulas and what are are there going to be any formulas what are going what are the content buckets going to be over the next uh, few years or so that are evolving and um, you know you have just the right panel to uh, you know look at that uh, so i'll start with uh, abhimanyu um <clears throat> manyu you have seen their entire spectrum from uh, television to ott uh one of the biggest shows in the industry taj which is an international and a global show with great ambition just came out for you so what i wanted to understand from you is over the last 5 years since the way that the ott industry has evolved and from the time you started making uh and conceiving uh, the first lot of web shows how has the thinking changed so where is the evolution happened from the time that uh, the ott industry what i would say as content 1.0 to the next lot of content which is 2.0 right now in terms of evolution how are you looking at that as a shift as a content creator primarily so uh, thank you matik i think um, you know um, in the last 5 years you've seen uh, largely Uh, when ott came uh, and you know when when we started creating content for ott 
uh, that's that was for the first time that you were seeing premium content uh, being produced uh, and you know we came from an economy of producing like thousands of episodes um, and now we were producing 10 episodes 12 episodes in fact when taj was written i wrote this 5 years ago we wrote it as 12 episodes by the time we launched it we knew that 12 episodes were too much so you see that it's already changed in, in, in the last 5 years so from the time you're writing it to to the time you're releasing it there's change happening and it's it's more uh, it's rapid it's quicker uh, audiences have uh, i wouldn't say changed they've evolved um you know they uh, they used to a lot more content um in the good old days when there was only one channel which was dd then came in all the satellite channels then we had vcrs so we used to consume films but now with web 2.0 when you had a lot of uh, moving visuals on the internet you had a huge amount of user generated content as well as streaming and i think that's um, evolved the consumer and that consumer now wants content uh, which is changing rapidly and quickly um, their the number of you know uh, their attention spans are reducing so what is the sweet spot how many episodes should you have a story uh, what's the strength of uh, you know that story to you know how many episodes should it go over so things like this are uh, you know are things that are uh, the challenge for con- uh, for creators like us and um, i feel this will continue to evolve because um, you know what is 10 episodes now might become the sweet spot spot might be 8 episodes and might be 6 episodes maybe 4 episodes who knows but um, that is clearly happening um, as far as s word is concerned um and as far as your a word is concerned as far as advertising video on demand is concerned that's also if you look at it right now it's largely pushed by uh, you know catch up television but you will have uh, streamers as well as um broadcasters looking at shorter format which will work for both television and and uh, digital and i see that that's already happening some of the stuff that you guys are doing is in line with that and some you know some of the stuff that all the guys in the panel here are doing is in line with that so i think this is um, where we see where i personally see that you know content's going to move and uh, as far as the creation aspect is concerned we have different challenges we'll we'll speak about it as we move on uh, shrishti yeah so you've been seen the entire spectrum you've been on both sides of the uh a story so as to say but just kind of sharing your insights from you know when you started out with netflix and that that's an era where i would call it that was web 1.2 where it was still evolving it's still evolving but streaming, streaming yeah of course not web no no streaming it's still evolving but uh, that point of time um you know the kind of uh, evolution that has happened over the past 4 uh, years or so and you've been at center stage when it comes to that how do you think the evolution has happened from you know the the initial products that came out say sacred games to the kind of content that we are seeing now uh you know it's what's really exciting to see is that the more things change they say the same according to me uh, i've been actually working for the last 30 years so i've worked across features and advertising and documentaries and then streaming both sides of it as well as linear television and doing daily soaps Uh, every now and again there's a moment which comes where it forces us to uh, be a better version of ourselves i think the good thing that's happening now is with streaming is that you can have access to what you want to watch without it having to be necessarily mass the scary thing that's happening is that people come into india especially looking for numbers and the numbers game kind of makes everything if you see even across the world all the content that's being made uh you know once you go into a volume game then it kind of becomes homogenized across whether it's um the marvel universe as well or anything that's big and broad uh, or our daily soaps uh, the ability of web to reach who you want to reach gave us content like sacred games that gives us stuff like elite that gives us stuff like taj you don't need everybody to see everything at the same time and it's it's living there like you're seeing with jubilee right now like it's found its kind of niche audience so i think we just need to f- keep making the best version of content we can 
all these aspects only allow us to reach our audience easier. That's interesting. Uh, Aradna, I think we'll pick your brains from a non-fiction um, content point of view. And I think um, one of the discussion points, and we've always spoken about this, is in terms of the evolution of non-fiction content. Uh, so while non-fiction content remains extremely strong when it comes to uh, television today, how do you see that evolution happening in OTT? Of course, it's ev evolving in very different ways in terms of uh, docu-reality and you know, reality shows. Uh, some of the talent shows really haven't translated into the you know into OTT as well. But um, it's a challenging time because I, I see that a lot of evolution that you know television that couldn't happen with television is happening now um, with all kinds of formats opening up when it comes to OTT. Can you shed some light on that in terms of what are the buckets that you see coming up over the next year or so? Uh, firstly, um, hi everyone. It's very nice to see some of the old faces and some of the new faces, which means it's a good mix of audience. That's good. Mothik, it's not always fun to sit with you because you always make us feel very old. Doesn't he, Neeraj? Like he always says, 20 years, 30 years, well, I don't know, experience, yeah, it has its value, right? Uh, as far as your nonfiction uh, question is concerned, see, there is a lot of stuff that uh, platforms like this offer in terms of tech, okay? So I'll give you an example of a format that we do. Uh, there is Indian Idol that we do, which we've been doing, like next year it'll be 20 years to Indian Idol in this country, right? Uh, and we've just finished uh, the 13th season this month which we've done on Sony, fabulous partners, had a really nice time, has been the number one show, has done very well. And we do it, of course, even in TV, we move with the times and we make changes, as you said, to that format while retaining the goal. We also do it for other platforms. And one of the platforms that I want to talk about is AHA, Alu Arvind's uh, OTT platform. We're doing Telugu Indian Idol over there, okay? So it is a regional version of a worldwide format. But what an OTT platform allows in terms of tech for us to exploit. So for instance, even in terms of our reach of talent, we in our finalists got a Telugu singer from the US of A, right? Just that whole thing, what Gaurav was talking to about earlier, like he was alluding to that, right? That how do we take India abroad? These are small measures by which suddenly that program becomes popular as an original from India in that audience, right? And you make these, you do more of this, and then the road ahead gets paved automatically, right? But in terms of um, the other formats, I'm talking about um, docu-reality, I'm talking about shows like Fabulous Lives. What are the other kind of formats that, you know, you see yourself uh, within the non-fiction space evolving? It might be interesting for the younger people in the audience to know. Look, I definitely think that there is something to captive reality. So one of our shows, which we've done with Netflix internationally and not in India for cultural reasons, Too Hot to Handle. That's been a super success, right? And already seen a next season. So I definitely think captive reality is a space that works very well uh, in the OTT space. And I think there's going to be more of that, even from us uh, in, the, uh, in that particular genre. Thanks, uh, Shobha. <clears throat> um, you, I mean, the, the biggest announcement that has come this year is, <laughs> I mean, you guys have directly hit a century, even before IPL started. Uh, so, I mean, which is great in terms of, you know, just inside sharing. So when you make, say, 100 movies, how do you decide what kind of content buckets are going to be those 100 movies? Are they um, gut decisions or was there a very specific plan in terms of uh, genres or audience tastes, viewership? Was all that as taken into account as well? And how was the entire, uh, you know, uh, pie cut out, so as to say? Uh, guys, thank you for having me here today. Uh, one, it's not 100 movies, it's 100 content pieces, which include films, shows, uh, mini shows, all of that. 50 at least. <laughs> more than, <laughs> more than. But yeah, there was a definite plan. Uh, it's not something that's come in just a year. It's five years of work. A uh, very definite plan in terms of understanding audience uh, segmentation, uh, understanding the use uh, and what people were watching. So genres, uh, specific genres, all size of films. And when I use this word all size of films, it doesn't mean big or small films, it's big or small stories. Uh, some which uh, resonate regionally, some which are more uh, populist in its, in its uh, thought process itself. 
uh, which cut across all types of languages and other barriers. But yes, there was a very definite plan. Uh, we have a mix of genres that cater to, we'd like to think, uh, most audiences. Uh, the idea was that we are reaching out to the length and breadth of this country, which is very diverse. So to cater to that diversity was the challenge that we did put across. So stories have been chosen according to that. Uh, we'd like to think we have a good mix. Uh, you all have seen some of it. Uh, I think the rest of it should stream soon. It should be out soon. But the idea was, it was never to look at um, uh, just one set of audience or just Hindi. We've uh, also put across Bhojpuri, Marathi, Bengali out there. We've also done Malayalam, uh, Tamil cinema um, very soon in other languages too. So it's all, it's all still growing, still evolving. We're still learning. It's all there. But the target is to make 50 films every year. Uh, it will change depending on how each of these are, are uh, uh, seen, perceived, appreciated. Uh, I think this is, this is an evolving business. We can never say that I want to do this or I want to do that. We'd like to see how the audience takes to it. And then cater. It's, it's a fluid business. I would hate to say that we know it all. Thanks, uh, Sundar. Um, yes. Congratulations on Rana Naidu and congratulations on Thank season you. two. Um, what one wants to understand from you, because you bring in a global perspective as well. Um, and um, I've heard obviously from industry, uh, you know, people in terms of your exposure when it comes to international formats, um, bringing international formats to India. Uh, I would like you to share, uh, you know, some light on that in terms of, I mean, it's a two way street in terms of when you look at getting international formats into India, do you also, I mean, what are the, what are the parameters that you're looking at when, you know, curating content like that, uh, so that there's a fit into the Indian market and conversely the other way around when it comes to, um, taking Indian content abroad as well, uh, because I'm sure you would have, um, been working on a strategy like that. Um, how does that exchange for you in terms of uh, just you as, you know, as your vision and your understanding? you think is going to pan out in the next, say, two or three years? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I mean, um, first of all, when, you know, Locomotive, we're not just the format company, but we've had some success with this one. So uh, <clears throat> it's easy to look at that and also see what works in the stories around the world that we can potentially bring here. And that's what worked with, with Ray Donovan. It's, if you know the original show, it has so many elements that work in India, um, especially um, the family, the family story that's there. And then we, uh, the original series has the, the lead character moving from Boston to LA uh, and is a fixer in, in Hollywood. And our character moves from Hyderabad to Bombay and is a fixer here in Bollywood. So. That's naturally, there was a lot of fit there. So it took a little while to work with CBS, who ultimately was a fantastic partner to get them to understand what it takes to do a show in India. Also with a partner like Netflix that needs the global rights and everything. And eventually we got there. I think what's interesting that you brought up as a question is what are we going to be doing to take India to the rest of the world? Because we naturally get very focused on our own market as we should. And we are all evolving as is the audience, like uh, Abhimanyu has said. Um, but at the end of the day, Korea has, its, has had its moment. And it's absolutely true that in the next year or two, India will also have, have its moment, without a doubt. You know, the time was for about 20 years where everybody around the world in global media was looking at China. China was going to be the answer. China was going to be the market that we all had to be in. If you were in global media, if you were in a studio in LA, et cetera. But that's absolutely ridiculous. India now going forward when the world war ends or the European war ends, when the recession recedes, inflation is under control, and you see capital again flying around the world looking for emerging market opportunities, India 
is going to be where that money comes and that capital comes. It may not be this year, but it's definitely going to be next year or maybe 25. And we're going to have a huge boom here and we have to be ready to take advantage of that. So when we talk, when you talk about what are we going to take out, we are getting better and we are getting better with our production, our storytelling, our writing, our performances. And you can see also with the success of RRR globally, how people are curious about what's coming out of India. So there's a huge opportunity here, of course, for us with our own market. And I'm fortunate, we're all fortunate to have taken advantage of that. But what's really fantastic is the moment that is coming very soon that takes India to the rest of the world. And, and we all have to be aware of that and take advantage of it. And it may come a lot sooner because the WGA, if you guys are all aware, is probably going to have a significant strike that's going to affect all of us because they're going to want to get content from around the world. And thanks to like Squid Game, et cetera, you know, viewers around the world are very used to seeing stuff in foreign languages. We've had a lot of viewership of Rana Naidu around the world. Hopefully someone at Netflix will give me that data, but uh, you know, I'll let you know after that. Thanks Sundar. Uh, Neeraj, I mean, uh, not many would know, but Neeraj is uh, the ace when it comes to spotting trends. He is the guy when he was heading set max, actually got the South Indian movie dubbing craze into the Hindi, uh, you know, satellite market. And that's where it's led to today. And then many other reasons. Huh? I mean, I mean, I'm saying lack of budgets was the big reason. <laughs> yeah, but still, you knew it you was knew. a fluke that worked. Okay, let me be absolutely yeah, honest. Well, it was great business, but it, it, it <laughs> set the trend. But at the same time, what is also what what he's done very interestingly, which very very rarely happens um, in broadcasting, is um, turn the content paradigm of a channel around, and which is sub TV. And I'd really like you to talk about that because a few years back when you took over sub TV, it was a very different creature. Yeah. I'm sure, and you turned it around, turned it around into something completely different from what it was, and um, in a, in a good way. But um, what was the logic and the rationale behind that? Because I mean, it was doing well at that point of time. Uh, so were you able to spot the trends before saying that, okay, this is the direction I need to do in terms of the kind of shows that I need to commission henceforth? Love to like really understand the strategy and the insights, uh, you know, of, of that change. Uh, um, I think uh, the good part today is that, uh, like Gaurav said, uh, you know, some time back, uh, TV is yet about 200 million homes, yet about, uh, you know, more than 800 million people watching television. Uh, despite, uh, you know, all, all the uh, noise that we heard about, uh, you know, cricket going digital and hence TV would sing, that hasn't happened. The ratings have held, two weeks of cricket ratings have been very good in Star Sports. So I think, uh, you know, this, this whole thing about, uh, you know, TV, uh, you know, dying off and TV kind of fading off uh, is, is uh, you know, uh, probably uh, uh, you know part of a larger agenda that some people have, uh, but TV is here. TV is 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 uh, probably not growing at the speed that you know we were used to, but it's definitely here to stay and it is stable. Uh, having said that, to answer your question, uh, you know, five and a half years back, uh, you know, when when this brand was handed over to me, uh, you know, we we had a predisposed position about the channel being a so-called comedy channel. And uh, it took me a good two years to figure out that it's not a sustainable idea. You know, there is very little writing talent available as far as comedy is concerned, even, even lesser acting talent available. And uh, you're very dependent on a few people, you know, uh, in, in terms of content writers, content creators, actors, to be able to sustain a model like that. And it took me two years of a lot of failures to realize that. Uh, uh, hence, I think uh, the option that we had was to do what everybody else was doing and rather is doing. And I think that's where the, you know, the danger lies for TV because there is a lot of sameness in the content that's being made across. Okay. It's uh, largely a 17 or 18 year old girl wanting to either be a swimmer or a cricketer or an astronaut or, you know, and uh, so on and so forth. So I think the choice was to uh, become yet another flanker, okay, uh, or choose a path uh, which would be tougher, uh, which would mean telling stories differently, which would mean, uh, you know, creating characters which were not uh, something that existed on TV, 
uh, taking the tougher path uh, to making content. But uh, at that point of time, um, I was very clear in my head that this is the only way to go about it, you know, uh, step by step. Uh, but probably the only right way to do things was to create something which was different from the rest of the existing channels. And I think it's paid off to a large extent because we've had flankers from, you know, networks apart from Sony, where uh, the flankers have tried to be uh, very similar to what, you know, the core channel was and, and, and the flankers have not worked, you know. So I think this strategy uh, is, is going to take a while, is, is, is risky because, uh, you know, it's, it's not safe because it's, it's content that has not been seen on TV for a long time. Uh, also, uh, the, the clear choice we have here is to work with, uh, you know, only a few producers uh, who, who have uh, a commitment towards that kind of a content. Uh, we cannot work with producers who uh, see content as projects anymore. You know, people who believe in the cause of making good content. It's taking a lot of time to, you know, put together pieces. Uh, we just launched the promo of a show yesterday, which I'm launching towards the middle of June, but we started working on the show, uh, I think almost way back in mid-November. So that's the kind of time it's taking. Uh, we, in any case, have a challenge of putting out six, seven episodes a week, you know. Uh, so I think a reorientation is something that uh, television per se will need. We need to tell our stories differently. We need to make our shows look good, the way we shoot shows, the way we project shows, the way we cast, the way we market. Uh, because if we don't do that, uh, it's going to hurt us really badly. So that's, that's our story so far. Thanks, Neeraj. Um, Manu, uh, what I wanted to understand is, and we, you've been talking about, um, you know, taking Indian content globally for years now um, and making significant strides and investments towards that as well. As Contelo, um, I mean, and just as a content creator who says special, I mean, you do all kinds of content, but as a specialist when it comes to historicals and mythologicals, uh, what is your roadmap as a content creator uh, to be able to take all of that interesting heritage, interesting content um, onto the next level, because you know you you're extremely strategically positioned to do that. Yeah, I think you know what we've been discussing today is you know many many a times IPL has come up, right? And what IPL has done for cricket uh, by you know just improving the overall quality of the game and also you know just making it more popular. And two reasons I believe that that's happened. One is you've had talent come from the heartland of India, or it means from the smaller towns. Um, and second is that you've mixed international uh, cricketers along with Indian uh, cricketers with coaches coming in. Um, so uh, you know, for us uh, globally, if we have to take content globally, we've got to be believing that you know we would need to collaborate with talent from the West also. Uh, to have certain HODs. In Taj, we had 10 HODs. Out of 100 people, having 10 people makes a lot of difference, I, I believe. And also, uh, you know, it gets a certain amount of discipline in into uh, creating uh, this specialized content, which is, you know, uh, uh, you know um, uh, more premium, uh, which obviously uh, we have had challenges uh, creating so far. And we're still early days. And secondly, I think we need to be able to get more trained um, uh, units. I think we have a lack of talent for sure, uh, lack, lack of trained units. And uh, therefore, education is very important. When I moved in, when I started creating content, I was possibly one of the few guys in my college that came and started creating content. But now, uh, because content was, wasn't really considered as a real career opportunity, but today it is. Um, and we have to make investments in being able to create this uh, pool of talent that can then help us tell these stories, mix it up probably with some, you know, international HODs and, you know, like I would say some coaches. And um, I'm sure we'll have a, you know, we'll have a greater success uh, uh, ratio to what we are being able to do now. Um, you know, and as far as I'm not only making historical, State of Siege is not a historical, it's a military drama. Um, and um, that too, we've used, uh, you know, a mixture of talent. 
uh, and I think that that's the way forward. Yes, there is definitely a, a challenge as far as commerce is concerned. I, I, I'm sure every all the producers sitting here on the panel will agree that you know we come from uh, uh, you know um, economy of having producing you know of producing about a thousand episodes uh, a year, and now we are trying to produce twenty episodes a year. Now, obviously, and it takes two years to do that. While television, you're producing a thousand in one year. So there is a commercial reality um, as content creators that you know. I don't know where the sweet spot for that is. Uh, there might need better partnerships between streamers, broadcasters, and and production companies to be able to you know. But that would be the impetus required to be able to create better content. To create the kind of K dramas Korea is doing, have the more Indian dramas uh, play out. I think we have we have fantastic stories, and we must tell these stories at um, uh, premium uh, quality level uh, that is needed for international markets. Thanks, Shristi. Now in your new hat as uh, in Phantom, um, and there are a lot of uh, younger filmmakers over here. um if they have to approach you what what would be the advice that you would give them what kind of content should they come to you with um is there a formula is there a parameter or are there any keywords that you're looking at in terms of the you know the new writers and the new directors who approach you i think the only keywords is a uh, keyword actually is a conversation starter unless that's two words uh the way i think the biggest uh shortcoming right now is the paucity of time and attention that we have so we're all fighting for attention uh with our content we at phantom we're looking at primarily a theatrical business so my uh um, point of view would react more from there is that we would want to do films that are films that you want to be recommended by your peers we want people to tell other people who they keep a picture of bring that urgency of going to the cinema having that conversation that starts and be true to yourself because there is no real formula there never has been it's always been one person's vision somebody's conviction and a whole lot of other believers that come together to make this thanks aradhna um and um, the, the, uh, this is again to do with uh, non fiction So while we see a lot of international formats and in non-fiction being adapted, what advice would you give for you know the filmmakers and content creators to actually be able to come up with their own non-fiction formats? Because that's an area that India has been lagging behind in a major way. Would that be something that you would encourage, or uh, would you, would you be open to that, or is that something you just don't get in terms of submissions? Oh, encourage! I mean, absolutely, and it, it's also happening. I kind of agree with what Manu said earlier, right? That there's we keep forgetting, and and I don't want to restrict it just to unscripted. Even in scripted, this whole thing that we talk about the web series, OTT platforms, all of that—that's very nascent in our country, right? And talent that's working on it, just about five years, and people have had a head start, right? Um, I think there are fabulous stories in India, and by that. Where's Anil? He's gone. I just don't mean Hindi film industry. I mean all the industries. Even in regional, I see so much of it. There's great stories. There are great storytellers. There's great talent when it comes to music, like everything, right? But the one place where collaborations would really help again is the lead that they've had. So that's happening now in our country too. As we're making more stuff. there's obviously more data coming in and we're getting a sense of who's watching what right um but if we were to get the best of that experience into original ideas that exist motic there's no problem with original ideas here but i think the aspect of that experience if it sort of gets merged with this then it's only a matter of time it's coming right it's 100% going to go from india to out thanks uh shobha now for the next 50 movies that you're going to make uh uh there there are directors and there are other writers and uh, technicians over here um if they have to approach you what is it that they should carry in their jola and give it to you so one i'd like to say i don't know whether that's 50 or 10 or 500 <laughs> i have no idea 500 500 <laughs> i'd like to think so all of us uh, uh the the point is in in these that we've already done 
we already have about uh, 40 uh, newcomers that we've launched, whether they are producers, uh, directors, uh, actors, like my Kachi Limbu, which went to Toronto, which opened at Toronto, was a new director. I have a new actor in it. It's a new producer. Uh, we also have very extremely established uh, content producers working with us, like Raju Hirani uh, or uh, Maddox. So it's got nothing to do with how do you approach. We are very accessible. Otherwise, we would never be able to reach out and make these numbers. It's not just numbers. What I request, because uh, to make this uh, uh, large reach of material for people, it's important that you have your uh, pitch correct. Uh, lack of a better word, I'd use the elevator pitch. Everything depends on the final script. I don't think we can work without that. But there needs to be something in that elevator pitch that uh, gets us interested. Uh, a lot of times I hear from uh, new talent, new writers and directors that my synopsis uh, not narration sun lo. But if I don't watch a trailer, I don't watch a film. So it's important that you put your effort into getting that elevator pitch right you need to also appreciate that any studio exec has only that much of time. Yes, we will miss out some very interesting material, but we will also catch the ones that we want to, uh, that we heard and we did like. I don't think we miss those out. Uh, the other thing which I'll say that in terms of reaching out, there's been no difficulty so far. We're all accessible. Our emails are all out. Uh, I think we're one of the most accessible people uh, in the country. And we've already done stories that have gone uh, internationally. We are also looking at other stories that we can tell. We've also, I mean, we've always been looking at remake rights from India or from uh, international sources. We've also sold some of our rights to international productions. I think we're doing it all. I just think the scale needs to get a little larger. That's what we are here for. Thanks, Shobha. Uh, Sundar, uh, someone who runs a production company that makes cutting edge content uh, for a, again the same question applies to you how does um, what is your talent acquisition process how how do people approach you do you have a process of outreach wherein you are able to reach uh, 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 the kind of key talent that you're looking at uh, to create the next set of shows and uh, films that you're looking at putting together yeah i mean uh a lot of people have brought up development and, and uh, developing talent and writers. I'm really happy to hear Gaurav talking about it and Anil and everybody. So we're the same. We like to work with emerging writers and emerging talent, people who have very fresh ideas. Um, so we, we take a lot of pitches and, and ultimately we want to develop something that will have an audience. It's, it's a lovely endeavor and it's fun to work with talent and write stuff and brainstorm and write. But if it's not, if you don't have an audience in mind, uh, then everything is lost. And ultimately that's the key for all of us on this, you know, know who your audience is. And if you come to us with a project, just like if you come to anybody on this panel with a project, you better know who you're making it for. Uh, I remember I always hated the term uh, crossover because it never really, it means you don't know who your audience is. You if make something for a very specific target audience and if it's good enough, other people will start watching it. So That's interesting. And Neeraj, again, I mean, and that's one more interesting challenge that you've been faced with, and I really wanted to ask you this, is now you have to um, curate and create content, uh, not just for, you know, your broadcast channel, but also for OTT, also for Sony Live. How are you able to traverse that? Are you looking at specific content for the OTT platform and specific content for platform, but then at the same time, uh, the brand remains, and it's the same brand on... Uh, both the delivery mechanisms. So how are you able to kind of reconcile that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, going forward, that is that is the, the key reality uh, for the sustenance of TV. Um, and especially if you have a, you know, a OTT platform in-house, uh, you know, to find the right bridge content, you know, is, is the key because... Uh, to be very, very honest, appointment television on, on TV is a fading reality. 
Okay, I think we already are, have seen uh, you know the drop in the reach numbers for various reasons. You know, what it, I mean, it's it's NTO to uh, your COVID to so many other reasons. Uh, so appointment TV probably will not survive beyond three four years. You know, uh, we've all seen that. Uh, but to get the right content, which is agnostic of the device, uh, where people can view it. Uh, on the choice of their device, the time of their device, the price of uh, you know their preference uh, is the key very very clearly, and I think one clear way to do that is uh, like what Sundar said is to segmentize. One will have to be absolutely clear in terms of the audience segmentation that one is gunning for, you know. So very very clearly for us, for example, uh, we are a no holds barred urban channel very, very, very clearly. If I do not resonate in the hinterland beyond a point, uh, you know, I don't really care now. Because gone are the days when I could grow that market. I don't have the bandwidth, I don't have the number of hours of content, I don't have the marketing monies to do that. So what I choose is uh, the urban market, the one million plus markets, which is markets with a population of, you know, minimum 10 lakhs. Uh, because that's where we see all the shine come, you know, in terms of everything that, that India is kind of going to grow into. You know, those are the markets that we spotted. Uh, and that's, that's what we are gunning for very, very clearly. And that's a decent market. Now, we will not get uh, ratings the size of maybe what, uh, uh, let's say, a Star Plus gets. Okay. Uh, but it's critical for me to devise content which caters to the right audience that the advertiser wants, and also content that straddles on maybe a Sony Live or whichever platform going ahead, you know. So it's, for me, that clearly is, is the way one needs to curate and look at content going forward. Thanks, Neeraj. Um, unfortunately, we don't have much time left, and I thought we would have some time for Q&A, but we are already running late. Uh, so I'd love to, uh, I'd like to wrap up the session, and I'd love to thank all our panelists for being so frank and forthright in their opinions. And they'll all be around so you can have your one-on-one -on -one interactions and questions with them as well. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.